Thanks, Mac. Uh, Max, it's a pleasure to be here. So again, I'm Mark Sigrist. I'm with the uh, Legal Vice Presidency Structured Finance and Guarantees Group here. We're the guarantees group of the World Bank. Now, a lot of the times when I tell people that, they think, oh, you must be with MEGA. Well, we're actually, I'm actually not with MEGA. I, we're involved with different types of risk mitigation uh, instruments similar to what MEGA provides, but, but a little bit different. So um, I recently joined the World Bank uh, f uh, four months ago. Before that, I was with a private law firm for about 12 years working on uh, basically a, a big law firm financing large utility scale uh, multi-million dollar power projects, and many of them renewables, uh, solar, wind, and, and, uh, and other types of projects in developing countries. Uh, our clients included uh, the International Finance Corporation, which, are, which uh, is one of the World Bank Group members. Um, so over the years, I've, I've, I've developed a, a great familiarity of what the market terms are for different project participants in private uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, and also what's an appropriate risk allocation between government parties and private sector participants in those projects. But I never really had to, cons you know, I, and I also felt proud of the work that I did because often I was working on transformational projects in developing countries. And I, and I said, hey, wow, I just worked on a power project in Jordan that now contributes up to 15% of the, the country's electricity. I feel great about that, right? But I never really had to, in private practice, think about what the impact of those projects were on the average citizen, other than, for example, raising the amount of access to power, which is, which is important, but, but I also, in, in the past four months, I've had to work on, I've been working on projects in Nigeria and Armenia, and they've, I came across a term that I hadn't encountered before, which, or maybe I had and I never really gave it much thought, the term energy poverty. Like, so what is energy poverty? It's, it's when, let's say, more than 10% of your, of your household income is spent on, on energy or electricity or you simply don't have access to reliable or, or electricity at all. Um, those are huge uh, issues for development, and it's why, that, why many of the projects we work on tend to be power projects. But uh, you know, Ar Armenia is an example where 10 you know, more than, I think 30% of the people in the country uh, live in, in energy poverty. And so every dollar that is spent on electricity uh, if, that, if, if, if the price of electricity goes up even just a little bit, it can have enormous impact on the average citizen. So every day I have to think about these issues in helping countries structure projects so that the price, is, the price of electricity to the average consumer is kept low while increasing the, the access to power for, for the population. So I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So now I'm a guarantees lawyer. What does that mean? I, we, the World Bank, uh, unlike in the private sector where my clients were, were banks or pro project developers, um, my, client are, my clients are the member countries of, of the World Bank where we're trying to work with them to help structure projects. But we sort of play an honest broker role. Even though our client is the member country, we're working very closely with private sector participants to attract them to build and finance projects because uh, for a member country to finance a project all by itself can, can, can pose a huge fiscal impact on the country. And at the same time, they, they may not even have the capacity in many countries to, or the expertise in the country to build projects themselves. Um, so um, that's sort of the, the, the guarantee products that we use also require, uh, if, if the guarantee is ever called on in favor of a pro project participant, then the member country agrees to indemnify or repay the World Bank for the guaranteed amount that we pay out. So we, 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 we have this enormous clout in, in the project, which gives private sector participants comfort. Um, but at the same time, we only get involved at the request of a member country to help them with meet their sector and their power needs. So um, uh, this ties into one of the really important uh, goals of the World Bank. I think the two main goals of the world, uh, focus for the World Bank in the coming year will be refugees and becoming a 
facilitator of capital, not just a provider of capital. So the World Bank has lots of capital, but it's not enough to meet all the world's development needs. And that's why we need to get the private sector involved. And there, the ways we do that is putting the World Bank clout and AAA credit rating to work for our member countries, especially the developing member countries. So um, if we could go to the first slide, I'm, I'm going to get back to super basics. Um, what is a private sector renewable energy project? I, I have these slides here because this is the type of project that I would n probably never have a chance to work on. This is, anybody, can, can anyone tell me what that is? Hmm? It's, it looks like a cistern, right? It's actually a biodigester. It's a, it's something you put kitchen waste into and it produces biogas that people can use to cook with cooking fuel for up to three meals a day. So if you could go to the next slide too. Um, I think this is kind of, this is kind of funny, the next slide. Um, this is, uh, so years ago, before I became a lawyer, I worked in Syria, and I came across this guy whose mother was Iraqi, and he, he was American, but he lived off the grid. And today he is going around the world and promoting a biogas, uh, a biodigester that can meet people's energy needs who are off the grid. Why do I talk about this, and what does it have to do with utility scale and large scale power projects, which is really only the only type of projects I've ever worked on. No one hires big law firms unless the projects are really expensive and they need they have lots of contracts and they need people to get get the get the deals closed. This is this is quite different, but there there are some links. Um, so uh, the links are th this this kind of project is an off grid type project, right? But in many developing countries, people don't even have the choice as to whether they can go off-grid or not. Many are off-grid because they don't want to be, or the country has unreliable power where people are forced to go off the grid even though they have, elect they, they have in theory, elect uh, access to electricity. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples that I've, I've encountered. So in Nigeria, 50% of the population is without reliable access to electricity at all, notwithstanding the wealth of the country. Um, they need to get access to, 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 to power on a, on a pretty large scale. In Armenia, people are grid connected, but, but they, many people, as I mentioned, live in energy poverty. And so a few years ago, there was a macroeconomic crisis in the country, which resulted in a, a declining, the, the currency declined, resulting in higher power prices for the average citizen. And many, many people in rural areas had to resort to going off the grid to meet their heating needs. They would go cut down wood and use traditional methods of burning wood, and they would have to uh, would burn that. But those, those, that required using illegally harvested wood, which can contribute to deforestation. And also burning wood for your heat is, isn't the cleanest for, for the environment. And so that's why it's super important to, to help people, not only help people with power, but keep the price low for the average consumer. So why would, uh, if we could go to the next slide too. So this is, who can tell me what this is? Picture up. Yeah, it's a, it's a utility scale solar photovoltaic uh, power generating project. Um, this is a kind of old project actually, but it's the only photo I could find in, in, in IFC's data, databases. But it gives you a good picture of what, what, it, what it's all about. Um, I'm gonna talk about utility scale solar projects a little bit because those are the ones that I've used most. And also, what's what are the pros of solar photovoltaic uh, generating plants when, it, when you're talking about developing countries? Um, the energy source is free, for one thing. The technology is, is proven, highly modular, scalable. You can have a small solar plant, you can have a huge one, and, and they're, they're getting bigger and bigger. And most importantly, sunlight and high levels of irradiation are where the energy poverty is. So if you look at a heat map of the world, that shows so high levels of solar irradiation, where solar is available to create uh, electricity. You'll find it in, largely speaking, in the developing countries. Um, this is power that, uh, energy that doesn't require people to import fuels, 
Uh, I, I think you've probably all heard these things before, but, it, but it's important. Um, developing countries have dominated the uh, PV solar market since 2015. Um, solar is on track to become the cheapest source of power in many places around the globe. In India, for example, uh, solar, solar PV generated electricity is now competitive with new coal plants. That's, that's tremendous. I mean, years ago, no one would even have thought that solar could be competitive with tr traditional fossil fuel burning power uh, sources. But, but we're, they're getting there, and those trends are continuing. So why would, a solar, why would a developing country want to get the private sector involved? It's complicated. If we could go to the next slide a little bit. So this, is, this next slide is a diagram of a typical private sector uh, solar photovoltaic project structure with involving the private sector. It's not just the host country owning the solar plant. You have the host government uh, gives a, uh, enters into a government support agreement with the project company. The project company enters into multiple contracts for the construction and the operation of the project. Uh, there's a power purchase agreement. There are commercial lenders because the, pro the private sector shareholders want to share the risk with debt, and shareholders also enter, you know, different shareholders were enter into an agreement to provide capital to the project. Up in the left-hand corner, you have the World Bank role as guarantor. I'm, I'm going to get more into that a little bit later, but it's it's quite complicated. Lots of contracts. Uh, it takes a long time to put the pro programs together and negotiate the agreements. And in countries where there's lots of political risk, the outcome is not even certain. So for all that complication, why even do it in the first place? Well, it's important to get the private sector involved for a number of main reasons. One, risk sharing. Uh, developing countries' resources are limited. Their fiscal uh, imposing additional uh, burden on, 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 a, on a government's budget can displace money that would be used for other public goods like education, health care, and what have you. Um, solar projects have high upfront costs of construction, and often countries can't, can't assume that burden. Um, why else would a country decide to get the private sector involved? To trap, tap private sector expertise. As I mentioned, developing countries are dominating the solar PV market, and this is largely due to private investment, not just domestically in a country, but from all over the world. What you get from that is increased expertise, increased economies of scale, driving the price of solar panels down, uh, ensuring that a project is built and operates to international standards. Um, all of those things are important. So. Um, but attracting private capital is very challenging for developing countries. If we could go to the next slide. If you walk away with just one thing in your mind when, when you're thinking about private sector renewable energy projects on this scale, I'd like you to keep this in mind. If you could click the, the next button. So this is a simple, when it comes down to financing projects, it all boils down to this, the risk and return. The private sector for, for a given risk will, will require a given rate of return. In developing countries where risks are endemic, the rate of return that will be required both from lenders and, share and equity is very, very high. And you get to a point where the project just isn't sustainable. If you have energy poverty in that country, people will just not be able to afford the power from those projects long term. But there is a sweet spot where if you can reduce the risk of a project and lower the rate of return that an investor or, or a lender will require, you can create a sustainable project that, that consumers can, 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 can bear the burden of. Um, so let's see. I've just got a couple more minutes. Um, I think let's, let's go on to the next slide, if I could, too. Um, my colleagues, as, as a lawyer here at the bank, we, I support, the, in many cases, the, 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 the Energy and Extractives Global Practice Group. And these guys have been looking at solar uh, PV auctions all over the globe and comparing prices and looking at trends. And there are, there are two slides here that they've put together that really sum up where solar is going and why it's such an important potential source for, for developing countries. So here, this is places in the world where that have undergone competitive tenders for, for solar projects recently. Um, 
that doesn't tell you a whole lot, but, but, but the green ones are where countries have decided to procure through competitive tenders. That's inviting uh, developers to bid on the right to build and own a project in that country. Um, and if you structure this right, you can, you can attract lots of bidders, push down the price of the electricity that they are willing to accept for the right to build that project. Uh, that's, and, and that seems to be the way that many, many uh, countries are going uh, in order to, to build projects. If we could go to the next slide, too. This, is, this shows a trend just over the past uh, three, three years. Um, countries, developing countries that are uh, building solar PV projects. You can see the trend is just going down and down. Uh, today, it's reasonable for a country to, to be able to build a project using a properly structured uh, project and get power prices that are less than 10 cents per kilowatt hour. That's reaching com competitive levels with other sources of power, other, other traditional and fossil fueled uh, power. So I want to just meant before I wrap up, um, I want to just mention what the World Bank's role is in helping push down the de-risking de a project and helping lower the required rate of return that a country or that a project, uh, that, that an investor in a project would, would require. One is competitive tenders, but other ways we, we have an on, the World Bank has an ongoing sector dialogue, ongoing and active uh, dialogue with member countries and their sectors to help them meet their goals, laying out different financing options for them, which can include clean investment funds, which are hugely concessional. That means that the rate of the, the, the interest rate on loans or money that comes from those funds is, is I, I probably shouldn't say I don't work for the, the, the funds, but it's almost like free money. It's funds that are set aside and available potentially for renewable energy projects like this, where you don't have to repay principal for 10 years. And then when you actually, and the rate of interest that you pay is, can be as low as 0.25%. Uh, it's, 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 it's very, very low. Um, other ways that we do it are through World Bank loans, credits, and guarantees, at, also at very low rates. The International Finance Corporation provides uh, low interest rate loans to developers and private sector operators, uh, both. And they, they themselves will, will try to facilitate capital, either by uh, taking a loan and then selling parts of the loan to private banks, um, spreading the risk and, and making the, their the, the member countries' funds go even farther. Um, they also invest directly in, in projects as a shareholder. And so that will, the, the, the value added, of course, when, when the World Bank gets involved is that it, it ensures uh, compliance with, with, with high environmental and social standards as well as anti-corruption guidelines. Um, and then my, you know, the World Bank also provides lots of risk mitigation products, like World Bank guarantees, where we will backstop a government's obligation to pay for a power purchase, pay, pay for, for power from a project, or if things go badly and the government has to pay a termination amount to the investors to make them whole, the World Bank will agree to guarantee that amount in, under certain circumstances. Um, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Association also provides uh, risk mitigation instruments uh, which, which, deal, which give investors comfort when to uh, be to, to, it's basically insurance that will help um, help investors who are affected by political risks, change of law. Let's say a new administration gets enact, uh, gets voted in in a, in a developing country, and they say, "I don't like this, these renewable energy prices. I don't like these these tariffs that we agreed to. I'm going to change the whole law," and that can have the result of leaving the investors high and dry. Um, but there are these risks through these World Bank Group risk mitigation instruments that can give the investors some comfort. I won't go into detail on how those things work. Um, the World Bank Group also provides a package solution that's available to countries, even those who are the poorest, where you would think it would be incredibly difficult to get a, power, uh, a private sector power project financed. Um, places like Zambia have successfully 
uh, conducted an interna international auction and that has resulted in very low power prices through IFC's scaling solar program. What is the scaling solar program? It's a program that puts together a package of, of products that will help a country work through that complicated deal structure in, in a very short, hopefully in a very short period of time and minimize the need to negotiate. There are template documents like power purchase agreements that the parties know are bankable. If uh, IFC provides advisory services to the country to help them put together a competitive tender with clear rules for the parties so that they are comfortable and know and are willing to, to to bid, to provide low bids for, for the right to build the projects. And it comes with pre-approved financing. So the world, it comes with a, a pre-approved World Bank guarantee. It comes with pre-approved loans from the IFC. All of these things, without, if they're not packaged, can take a tremendous amount of time to negotiate and, and leave a lot of uncertainty. This reduces the risk and keeps the projects within that sweet, sweet uh, green zone that you saw on that diagram. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there, but again, you know, the takeaways that I'd like to leave with you are uh, private sector involvement in renewable energy uh, projects is, is important to share risk and also to improve project uh, quality and the benefits to the consumers. But it's super important to remember that for projects to be sustainable so that the average citizen can, can actually pay for the power and it doesn't, and the project is, you know, sustainable in the long run. I, I'm going to open up to questions. Um, I've probably already taken more time than I should. Um, that's, that's, abs that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, yeah, please do think of some questions. Um, I just actually returned from South Africa, and I saw that the estimates for <coughs> uh, for renewable energy projects in South Af Africa have actually dropped even more because of the um, private, uh, public private partnership program that South Africa has implemented on renewable energy. So it's really exciting. Um, the IFC also has published that you know, over the next 15 years, we're going to see $23 trillion of investments in infrastructure and green developments. So these are really exciting times. And, and now we heard from Mark that you know, the World Bank is positioned and is making it really easy for the private sector to help push these renewable energy projects. So over to some questions. There's one on, on, one in the back here. Um, oh, over here. We'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, I will have two questions. It's about private sectors and renewable energy. First of all, if we work about renewable energy with individuals, not with governments, because I believe in something, it's like, so we, every day, year by year, we will ask about more energy. Like today, you will have two devices uh, worked with electricity. Tomorrow, we will, you will need three or four. So if we work about make people generate their electricity, like it's working in uh, Hawaii. It's like you use the wind and with the solar energy in your home and generate your electricity, and then if you have extra energy, you can sell it to the amenities. That's the first question. It's like why we think like we should work with the government or big plants, because it's, I do not believe in the uh, efficiency of big plants. Like in Morocco, they have a huge solar energy, but I don't believe in their efficiency because it's like, I'm studying in electrical engineering, and I know that solar energy, it works with, like, they need not so high degrees. And also in Africa or, let's say, dry areas, the, uh, the sands will make so much problem for them. So that's the first question. And second question, it's about renewable energy. Do you think it's really, it's, we will, can say it's sustainable like it's if it's for solar it's just during the day but during the night what we can do and if it's wind if there are wind it's okay but it's not windy day it will be a disaster for me so as a government i cannot say that i will work with renewable energy because it's like it it will like but we so difficult to me to me uh, to work with us, and uh, thank you. Okay, let me take, let me see if I can get your questions right. So the first one had to do with, um, I think, your what you were mentioning. I think are distributed 
energy, where people put solar panels on their roofs and they use it for their needs. And to the extent they don't need it, they can actually sell it back to the grid. Um, those are great. Those are those 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 types of initiatives are great. We're seeing them building up all over the world. I I can only talk to my, I mean, as, as a World Bank lawyer and our clients are, are the member countries, governments, right? And so by, by definition, we are working with member countries uh, very closely in helping them, uh, helping them achieve their sector goals for the power sector. And only one aspect of that, I'm sure, is, is utility scale projects. I'm sure that, I know that there are many other aspects of that 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 we, as the World Bank, get involved with, and, and even non-governmental uh, entities get involved with. Um, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't. I'm not. A, a utility-scale solar project is is not exclusive of other options out there, like smart grids um, and and those sorts of things. Those those are to be encouraged. But I think the challenge is. Uh, uh, it's still a challenge, you know. The, I think the expertise with the private sector is, is it, the same story applies. People will not be willing to invest unless there is a a predictable and there's a predictable climate in which they can invest, where they can expect to get some res, some return from their investment. And there are many ways that governments can 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 encourage that by by lowering taxes and import duties for the equipment that's needed to, 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 uh, to build distributed generation. Um, but those are all important. I mean, I, I read recently in, in I think, um, Oxford Analytica that the transformation that's going on in renewables, including smart grid and other, other, uh, uh, other uh, changes that are going on, are, 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 are similar to the changes that went on in telecom, where a smartphone is now just a phone, where and, and to, so in the future, I think we can expect that you know renewable energy will just be energy. It's just it's Hawaii. I think you mentioned. I think in, in by 2030, 30, they plan to be completely clean. That that poses a challenge that you raised in your second question, which is, okay, these are inter intermittent sources. This is one of the the, con the negatives of of renewable energy. Solar, the sun only shines during the day. Wind. It's, it's intermittent. There are windy days, there are days that aren't windy. But there are huge advances that are going on in, in energy storage, both through batteries and also pumped storage, where during the day, a, a, wind, a wind turbine, wind, wind, wind plant can, can, the energy produced from that can be used to pump water to a high place. And then when the energy is needed later, the water can be released, turning a turbine and then generating electricity as and when it's needed. That kind of technology is getting better and better. I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but I, but I know that we, are, we can expect further advances in that area. So, but those are great points and great questions. Um, um, question in the back. <coughs> I'm glad it's, uh, as I said before, I'm an attorney in my country, and I'm also a compliance and risk management professional. So I understand exactly what the role of the World Bank is in calculating the risks in funding uh, green projects. Uh, from your expose, it, it's extremely lofty with the all incentives the World Bank has put in place for countries to take advantage of those incentives. But from your expose, apart from Nigeria in tropical Africa, I don't see a lot of African countries which have the advantage of the natural input of sunshine, which could be exploited in solar energy. So can I just, from your studies and from your experience, what are the challenges you are facing with African countries? Why aren't they taking advantage of all these incentives and the natural input which they have, which they have sunshine 24, or 12, 12 months a year? So why? Is it because of the, the risk of politi political risk, which are very high? Or why don't they get involved in this project? That's a good question. So I, I, my, you know, my experience with, with working on bank projects and working directly with governments is, is, is relatively limited so far. I, I started with a bank in, in July, but I've, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at, at Nigeria and, and primarily Nigeria. Um, what are the challenges there? Um, we only get involved ultimately when the government requests 
us to get involved, and when they actually decide, yes, I decide that I want to use 100 million of my allocation from the World Bank as a guarantee, and I want to use this structure where we're using this money to backstop a government utilities payment obligation under a power purchase agreement for a series of solar projects. Oftentimes, you know, the, the, the options are there, but the, you can run into political inertia. Um, you can run into macroeconomic problems that where the country is simply focusing on other fires that they need to put out. I mean, Nigeria is a, is a good example where recently uh, it, they're in recession. Um, the, the power sector is not where people hoped it would be a few, you know, a few years ago. If you look at the country partnership framework that the World Bank puts together with the host countries um, and sets out long-term goals for what they'd like to achieve, there have been a lot of challenges that have cropped up that have really made it difficult to achieve those goals. Um, uh, there are huge gas, there are huge natural gas resources in, in Nigeria that are, much of which are being flared because they, they can't use it and they can't get it to, to, to market. Um, there are some success stories. Uh, about a year ago, we, the project participants closed the Azura Independent Power Project, which is a gas-fired power project in Nigeria, which benefits from Nigeria's huge gas resources. And the hope was that on, on, the, on the heels of that success, a series of solar projects would be able to follow because we've got a project structure. We've created a track record where people are, there are investors who are already getting involved, both Nigerian investors and foreign investors. They meet, they, they get to know the various players from, from NBET, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Energy, and they become more comfortable so that, but, uh, there are, uh, I mean, maybe if oil prices go up again, uh, the uh, Nigeria will come out of recession. It will make things much easier for, for them to take decisions. Because ultimately, look, even with a World Bank guarantee, it require even with pushing some of the risk to the private sector, the government still has a contingent liability if things go bad. And a decision to take out a guarantee from the World Bank means that they have to provide an indemnity to the World Bank. And that's a contingent liability of the federal government. And they may not want to. I, Nigeria has other, I, I can only talk to Nigeria, but th there are lots of, uh, there, are, there are collection problems in the, the supply chain of electricity where even though the power is made available, the end consumers they may not have the ability to pay, and then the distributors of power themselves cannot pay the power purchaser, and so they're dealing with a collection rate of maybe 50% or less, and how is that sustainable? And that poses a huge risk to a private investor who's saying, look, I, you know, can I expect to be, get my return, the return, or can I expect to recover my investment and get a return over 20 year, over the 20 year term of a power purchase agreement with this liquidity situation? When things are that shaky, also the World Bank says, well, you know, there are certain fundamentals that need to be improved before this is going to be a good idea for you. So uh, I, uh, that's, that's about the most I can say, but even, even in a place like Zambia, where if you put together um, Nigeria decided to do things differently from a scaling solar approach, the, the package, the one-stop shop package deal that I mentioned. Um, uh, but ultimately, it's the Nigerian government's decision how they want to proceed. Um, it's, it's a challenge, yeah. Um, Mark, um, we, we have time for one more question, and then uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay. Hi, my name is Jacqueline, um, and I wanted to ask a question about uh, potential areas for synchronizing World Bank um, projects with broader reforms and in intellectual property frameworks to the extent that they um, incentivize the private sector to continue developing these technologies, <clears throat> while at the same time making sure that these technologies are affordable for countries that would like to import them. That's a good question. I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to speak to um, intellectual property issues, but I think you, know, you, you may be talking about encouraging domestic intellectual property in developing countries in renewables. Is that what you're talking about or, or something else? Okay. Um, so 
yeah, I, I, I think that it's hard for me to, to speak uh, to that issue because it's not really, in, ha I haven't had that much experience with that. Um, that being, the experience that I have had, for example, with, with Armenia, Armenia has a highly educated population that, that with lots of engineers and who can, who have a lot of experience in solar technology, for example, but they don't have a solar program yet in the country. Um, I think Armenia, one of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons why solar is interesting to them is not only that they have a lot of solar resources, but also that they have a population that can benefit from a solar program expanding um, where there's an educated population that understands the science and technology behind it. And that could foster homegrown uh, companies that even maybe build their own solar uh, panels or that improve the technology. As for the intellectual property issues, whether you know, I, I think that unless you have a, a stable regime for protecting intellectual property rights in a country, a, a private investor isn't going to be very, is going to worry that someone will just take the technology or what have you. But I, I can't, I can only touch the surface of that issue, unfortunately, do my, that is, did that address? For solar, to be honest, solar panels have become, the technology is so proven, it's almost become a commodity. So it's, you know, solar, solar panels are either priced or pegged to the dollar because it's a commodity and, it, and it's, everybody knows that if you don't buy this person's panels here, you can buy it from anyone else anywhere else. The supply is, is really high and it's, it's proven and simple technology. Um, for other renewables, I, I think that, you know, I, I think wind is, wind technology is also pretty advanced. There are, there are incremental improvements, but um, we, I think renewables, uh, utility scale renewable projects are at the stage where, let me, let me, let me put it this way. Projects that I work on, which are utility scale, usually people won't build a utility scale project unless the technology is so proven that it's, it's, it's because it becomes super risky otherwise. Um, for new technology, it requires an even greater intervention. I've had experience in the US where new type of nuclear technology required some support from the US federal government because it hadn't been deployed yet. And, but the government saw an saw that if they did deploy it, it would improve people, it, it would improve the technology, it would create jobs. It, it, but, it, but in the developing world, I think it's, when, because my experience is with utility scale, very large projects, I typically don't deal with intellectual property issues because they're usually so established and, and the, the technology is so commoditized that it, 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 it isn't so much an issue, yeah. I hope that answers the question. Um, thank you so very much, Mark. Thank you. Um, thanks to the audience. A round of applause for Mark Segres. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.